I'm John Wickerson. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, Ask Me Anything with Peter O'Hearn as part of PLDI 2020. Uh, so it's a tremendous honor for me to host uh, this session. Uh, Peter was actually one of the first academics I encountered um, when, I was, when I was a brand new PhD student. Um, it was um, at the Laser Summer School on the Italian island of Elba back in 2008. Uh, do you remember that, Peter? I remember it very well. Beautiful weather. Sun, sea, and software engineering, I think, was the, was the motto. Um, and I do remember thinking that this, uh, this Irish professor seems... I got muted there. Um, I thought this, this Irish professor really does seem to know what he's talking about. Um, but many years later, I discovered that Peter is in fact Canadian, and I'm just rubbish at accents. Um, Though Peter has indeed lived in the UK for about 24 years, I reckon. Um, he's held academic positions at Queen Mary and UCL in London. Uh, he's mainly been working at Facebook for the last seven years. And he's known uh, for separation logic, uh, which he co-developed with John Reynolds and others about 20 years ago. And for then leading the development of separation logic based program analysis tools that aim to scale to industrial sized programs. So without further ado, let's ask some questions for Peter from the community. So I, I guess I kind of want to uh, do a sort of technical first and then gradually moving to less technical as we get a bit tired uh, over the course of the uh, session. So a technical question first then, um, from Eric Biederman. Uh, do you know if anyone has built a type system inspired by separation logic? Yes, Francois Potier and Jonathan Pratzenko have something called Mezzo, which is inspired by concurrent separation logic. Um, and this uses the logic to do um, resource management. And it's quite fascinating. I don't know where it's gone, but it works very well. Um, I know there are other people working on these sorts of things. I'm not, yeah, other companies besides Facebook. And I, I don't want to really say anything because I don't know how publicly they've gone with it. But I know those ones, there are undoubtedly others. Yeah, I think Francois Potier was the one who came to, to my mind when I saw that question as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, this is a question from Piyush Kushwarha um, from Triple I T Delhi. Uh, and so, do you have a two decades into the future? Uh, so two decades, mind, uh, into the future, vision for reducing burden on programmers to make program verification more widely adopted? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I can make it to the two decades part, but I think that um, the burden bit is not just about automation, but it's about the way that we deploy it. So, and this, 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 this is related to technical problems. So let me put it this way. Right now, verification technology is based on what I would call a pay upfront model. Specify lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of things, and in some distant future, get a payoff. Um, this is a huge, huge, huge burden. It's not just for the effort of doing the proofs, it's there's not an incremental path to getting value out of the tools. So, I, the, so my aspiration is that someday we'll have a pay as you go model. Put in a little bit of effort to do specifications and proofs, get a little bit of benefit back, put a bit more effort, get a bit more benefit. And not just in a sort of religious sense that says, I love proof, but a way that could measure things. And we could then have some evidence of, of, of how that helps in an incremental way. And I think the more we get to the incremental um, value model, the pay-as-you-go model, the easier it will be to scale to many people. Um, so that I think in my mind is the number one thing um, there's lots of other things. I mean, education is important. The quality of the tools is important. The tools are not, you know, we, we need good tools to give to students so then everybody knows verification and things like this. But um, pay as you go and education to me are the main problems. Yeah, I, I can't remember where this idea came from, but I, I think it might have been Matt Parkinson. Um, and it was this, um, you, if it was him, he was talking about this idea of um, that uh, you have to give something to the programmers that's perhaps a little bit more than just um, absence of bugs, because that, that's a kind of that's 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 an 
it's nice to be told that, but it, it's it's a, it's kind of an absence of 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 things. And and um, I think I remember talking a bit about whether the verification effort could give you something you know positive that, that, that actually help you program. It's um, always difficult to 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 do that, but but to um, you know measure the the benefit in, of an absence, it's always difficult. But I mean, I think I would like to. Um, the word assurance is important, but I, I'd like verification and testing to be more together so that not in any kind of opposition. They're both just trying to help people understand um, how use, how much we can trust our systems. And the evidence that's, that's given, it would be great if the evidence wasn't self-referential. Like if I say, I've got a proof, that's sort of self-referential. It would be better to, you know, if we can measure the impact in some way and then give it to somebody who's never even heard of proof. That would be mm. a dream, but yeah. not, easy, not too easy. And because I'm in industry, I'm constantly thinking about things like this um, because I might have to explain the importance of something. And when it's self-referential, that's not as good as when it's um, described in independent terms. It's very interesting. So you, you mentioned verification and testing, and I think that's a nice segue into a question uh, coming from John Regeer from uh, University of Utah. Uh, so he says, I enjoyed the back and forth about under approximation versus over approximation on Twitter, particularly regarding concrete engineering benefits of incorrectness logic. Mm -hmm. um, so he says he doesn't have an actual question, but he wonders if you wouldn't mind reprising these issues a bit here, since um, he thinks your audience would enjoy hearing about this. Yes, um, so the interesting thing is, because, is when I went to industry, um, I only ever developed over approximate things, so um, based on logic and stuff like that. And then when I got into academia, I mean, in, in the industry, I found that bug catching was a, a good way to get value out of this stuff. And then we developed tools at Facebook that they had the, the structure of a compositional abstract interpreter, but they didn't satisfy the usual over approximate soundness theorem. And we tried again and again to change the analyzer to make it satisfy the soundness theorem. And that tended to make the analyzer worse. And then I got irritated and I said, why don't we stop trying to um, change a good analyzer and make it worse to fit, this, to fit the theorem and instead figure out the theorem that we need. And so the theorem that we needed was based on under approximation and actually it's combinations of under and over approximations which you tend to need. And this opened up quite a lot in that there's a whole missing theory of under approximation, I think, which is not the dual of the over approximation theory and, and, and I could go into detail on, on that. And I don't think it's necessarily difficult, but selecting technically difficult but selecting the right concepts isn't too easy so it's, it's just fascinating to go there so once again um, i'm not seeing testing and verification in opposition but i'm trying to fill in sort of a missing part of the theory which is taking the under approximate more seriously and i think ultimately we want tools that do both under and over um, and on in the foundation side the under has, has has not gotten as much attention and so it's really funny you see i was I, I was, it was, it was like I had blinkers on when I was in academia. I never considered that testing could have a nice theory like this or the under approximate. Could have, never occurred to me. We had to try to do over approximate because that was the teachings, like thou shalt do it. It was the church of over approximation. Um, but I was forced into it. And I mean, I've gained a lot in theory by going into the, into the industry, which forced me to bump into things that I wouldn't have bumped into. So that's been really great going back and forth between the theory and the practice. So um, it's on the theme then of moving between um, academia and industry, which you've, you've already touched upon. Um, so this is a, this is one of my questions that I've prepared. So, so you, um, so one of the well-known perks of working in academia is that you have this sort of intellectual freedom to work on the problems that interest you. At least that's, that's what I hear from people in, in academia. Mm -hmm. um, but listening to some of your keynotes, I get the impression that despite the fact that you're primarily working in industry, you actually seem to be tackling exactly the problem that you seem to want to work on, this scalable uh, program analysis tools. So um, my question is, have you really got the best of both worlds here? So the benefits of working in, in industry and the impact that that gives, uh, but also the intellectual freedom um, of academia or is it that actually for Facebook for forces you to work on things for the good of the company that you'd really rather not work on? No, I don't work on anything that I'd rather not work on but um, 
I think that the, the academia does have a greater degree of intellectual freedom and that's, as it, that's correct. Because as an academic, if I want to say, you know what, for 12 months, I'm gonna just work on theoretical physics because I think that that's fascinating. Then I could do it, right? I, I, I could definitely do it. Um, but um, in the company, it's not right. I mean, you, you're, you, should, you should be working on things that are um, of, of, of relevance to the company, even if not of immediate re relevance. So, um, so there's nothing good or bad about that statement. Um, so I, but I am working on what I want to work on. So I happen to have landed in an extremely fortunate situation where I'm working on what I want to work on. And um, I think that this area of program analysis and program verification, so reasoning about programs, at the moment, I mean, we, there's lots of great work to be done in academia, long-term work especially, uh, fundamentals, very important to us. But um, this field's at a point where it's possible to play off the theory against the practice in a very tight loop. And in the engineering, I think you don't get the best results necessarily by just doing only engineering. And you don't get the best um, theory by doing only theory necess necessarily. And I think it's a great time to be playing these things off against one another. So I've landed in a fortunate situation. Um, the program analysis subject I feel is like that at the moment. I'm not making that as a general comment on academia versus, so to speak, industry. But I'm, I'm fortunate to be in this situation now and I am working on what I want to work on. Cool. Yeah, I guess if you were still doing your denotational semantics stuff from the 80s and 90s, you probably wouldn't be doing that in, in Facebook. That's right, but, but that's, that's how I knew, I know to do compositional program analysis because I learned it all from denotational semantics, but anyhow. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 I guess so. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so again on the, um, um, academia industry uh, interface. Um, so uh, Julia Belakova uh, from Northeastern University uh, asks, were there any assumptions or beliefs about how industry or software development operates that you had as an academic, which were proven wrong when you moved to industry? Maybe, maybe some specific research topic that you thought was, was important, but developers didn't actually care about? Or was there something that you couldn't think of in academia, which became really obvious when you moved to industry? And I, well, I think I know the answer to that, that last one. There's two things that really, like let's forget about the under approximation and over approximation, because I already mentioned that. There's two things that really stand out. One is um, false positive rate. So I um, didn't know much about program analysis. I was doing, I was sort of a logician. Right, or a semanticist, and these people kind of can you into Stefano dragged me screaming into program analysis. And then I listened to the people who wrote in the subject and said the most important thing is the false positive rate. And then I went into the company and then we got the false positive rate down as far as I, I was aware. And then we deployed our tool in two ways, one in batch mode, one in incremental diff time continuous mode. And the batch mode had a 0% fix rate and the other one had the 70% fixed rate. It's the same analysis with the same false positive rate. And I realized, oh my God, maybe the false positive rate isn't the be all end all. Um, it's important, but maybe it's less important than people indicated. And I learned that. speed. Not about that. Yeah, the, 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 the two things, one is um, feeding, giving the developers the, 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 the feedback when they want it and to with the workflow made such a difference. Um, and the, the, we found that the Cristiano Calcani put it like this, the, there's a reports decay with time. The value of reports, the longer you take to make the report, the value of it to the people decays. And so this is on a huge code base, this is extremely important. Um, and I had, I had heard from people things like speed is important, workflow integration is important, but that example just drove it home to me in a way that I just wasn't prepared for. And I was completely stunned by it. Um, and okay, and then there's another case that actually really surprised me, is that I used to assume that static analysis of, of sort of semantic property, trying to solve undecidable problems, this should be hard computationally, and testing should be rather easy computationally. Um, and so, so I thought static slow, testing fast. But what I got, when I got in the industry, I found static fast, testing slow. So Whenever we're trying to get fast feedback to people, it's easier, easier to do it often by a static analysis than by a testing. And especially whole program testing, whole program testing tends to be run later 
in the in the software development process because it's more resource intensive. Now that's not a for all. What I didn't say it has to be that way, but the tendency is often like that based on the analysis techniques we have. And I was never expecting that at all. I was expecting um, semantics based program analysis should, should be the inefficient thing, but it turns out that it's, it's the efficient thing, um, and we we can get the answers pretty quickly for many kinds of checks. Okay, those were two things that I wasn't prepared for. Thank you. So um, here's a question from Jan de Moink Hughes from the University of Glasgow. Um, and it's continuing on this testing verification blurring theme. He says, dependent types blur the line between types and values, proofs and programs, and testing and verification. Um, with your experience in verification, is this a direction we want to go in, or should we keep the two separate? Um, I'd rather not keep the two separate. And whenever I approach something, I don't think, am I over approximate or am I under approximate when I begin something? I think, how do I help the people? How do I help people? And then the technical stuff follows after that. Now, I don't know if dependent types allows you to blur things and then decide later. I'm not sure. So I can't make any, I know what dependent types are only as a theoretician, right? Like Martin Loaf type theory. Oh, cool. Um, calculus of constructions. Cool. The specifics of the way these things are implemented and used. Um, I'm not really that well aware of it, but um, I'm into not blurring or not coming down too hard on one side or the other of testing versus verification early. And I like dependent types, but I can't comment more on whether it's a good direction for people to go in. Um, I think it's a cool thing to think about for sure. Excellent. Um, so here's a question from uh, Thomas Reps from the University of Wisconsin. He says, there's a famous paper entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in... Dot, 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 and a paper by uh, Moshe Vardy uh, titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Logic in... Dot, dot, dot. However, these mental tools don't seem to be so unreasonably effective in the tech industry. Can we make formal methods into something that is unreasonably effective? Uh, and he notes that John Rushby used to say that formalisms must be electric, which is an issue which is related to an issue you already touched on. Electric? Okay, I don't really understand what Rushby is saying there. Um, um, I, you know, formal methods under the covers and the semantic side of it, you know, guiding many tools is great. Now, whether we want logic to dominate the industry so that people are writing the formulas and that's guiding things. I just don't know. And, um, you know, I don't even know if I want to take that as an aim. I'm going to take, help, logic is, I like logic probably more than almost anybody listening, right? Like I'm first a logician and second engineer and things like that. But um, thinking from the point of view of computer science, I really think we, let's help people. I always think let's help people and then let's pull in all the techniques, right? So I don't, I can't see a path at the moment where for huge amounts of code developed, um, de developed in a fast iterative way, whether writing specifications first is a way to do it, unless those specifications become the programs. Um, I'm not sure if that's a very um, good answer to, to Thomas's very good question. And I might, um, add to it later, but okay, that's what I've got to say about it at the moment. Sure. Mm -hmm. So just a, a housekeeping note, it is by my watch now 20 past. so if anybody wants to uh, go and catch the next PLDI session, you're very welcome to, uh, to leave. But uh, we have a few more questions uh, in the Slack channel, so if Peter's happy to carry on, uh, I certainly am. So um, Karim Ali from the University of Alberta in Canada um, asks, do you think there's more um, that uh, static analysis can do uh, to help developers, even more than it, it currently is, uh, say, in Facebook? Um, and if so, which areas do you think academics can help advance to make this happen? The second is a very, very good question. Um, 
The first is yes. I mean, I mean, yes, it, it, it can do so much more. Because I find with the, the team that I work with, the Infer team, we have many, many, many problems. Um, and we're always at the edge of knowledge and we have to, we have to um, prioritize so severely because there are so many problems that there's many problems we aren't pursuing. Um, and it's very easy. The reason that you can get to the edge of knowledge so quickly is because there's this huge space of algorithmic things you might do with program analysis. And I think it's been sparsely explored. Let me give you an example. Um, it, it's really great to have something like incremental program analysis that on a 10 million line code base um, runs proportionally to the, 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 the size of the, a change to the code base, right? That's what an incremental analysis would be. Now, several industrial companies like in Coverity has done it and, and Infer at Facebook has done it. They've, they've done um, sort of advanced program analysis and they've implemented algorithms that are somehow um, incremental, but there's not, to my way of thinking, a clear foundation and a clear mapping out of all the possibilities done in that area. So when we um, try to deploy a certain check, then we try certain things to make it work and we don't have an idea beforehand what's going to work well. We don't have an idea beforehand. Um, very quickly, um, you're, you're, you're on, on too nice. So that's, that's an example. Um, so scale, it, 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 scale is, is really important and underexplored, incremental scale as well. And the more we can do that, the more we can deploy checks to help people. Even basic things like static analysis for um, buffer overruns at scale. I'm not aware of um, really effective techniques for that. I've, been, I've tried it and it's very difficult. It sounds like it should have been solved decades ago, but it hasn't done. Um, now, what the, the, the academics can do is I don't need them. We don't need them to try to mimic what the teams like at Coverity and, and, and Facebook and, and Amazon are doing. We, I, for me, more work on fundamentals. That doesn't just mean theory, that means algorithms. The fundamentals is, is really good because that builds the knowledge going forward, right? It gives us something that we can build upon. So I would encourage the academics to feel good about doing fundamentals. That doesn't, the fundamentals can have an experimental aspect feel good about that and not trying to be too close to impact too soon. And realize that there's just tons to do and this is the nature of um, getting after undecidable questions. Full employment theorem for us folks. Thank you, Peter. Um, okay, so talking of academics uh, and so on, um, uh, I want to go back to a, a question from Doug Lee uh, from Oswego who uh, is asking a 25 year old question, um, uh, which says, explain why so many people who work in memory management also work in concurrency from formalist to hackers and in between. So um, I, I think Doug is an old friend of mine and, and I used to work in Syracuse and he worked in Oswego in upstate New York and we used to meet on an almost weekly basis and have friendly arguments about formalism and hacking and things like that. Um, he even like challenged me and introduced me to non-blocking concurrency when I thought I had a good logic, concurrent separation logic for reasonable programs. That was really fun. Now, on the topic of memory management and, and concurrency, I think it boils down to this, is that they're both about resource management or not all of concurrency is, but certainly shared memory concurrency is. It's about resource management. And so when you're thinking about the concurrent processes, you're managing the scarce resources amongst the collection of concurrent processes. And memory management, well, that's about memory, about managing resources. And then concurrency gets especially tricky when the two of those come together, as illustrated by non-blocking concurrency, when you've got the hazard pointers, now get Michael's hazard pointers and things like this to do the, the memory management. So um, Doug, if you're listening, I think they both do resource management. Um, and I suspect that um, after this, you'll tell me why I'm wrong. And that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll keep an eye on the Slack thread anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, so I guess going back again, you know, several decades, um, I wondered if I could uh, drag you back to the early days of separation logics. This is a, this is a question I had. Um, 
So obviously separation logic is, is stratospherically popular. Um, but uh, if you were to go back, say, 20 years ago, uh, 20 years or so to the moment, if there was one, uh, when you and John Reynolds and others first invented separation logic, um, did you immediately realize the importance of that discovery? Or has its success surprised you? I immediately realized that there's this thing called local reasoning. Um, so I figured out that, that the frame rule, um, this thing called the frame rule was sound. And this meant this addressed an old AI problem, which is that there's things don't, it's irritating to specify all the things that don't change. And we found that, oh my God, if you arrange the specifications in a certain way, then all that comes for free and specifications will become simpler. And, and this all, all stemmed from the locality of program behavior. So a whole bunch of things came together at that moment for me. There's some several other moments too, but that for me was the most important moment. Um, um, that, I mean, I think I was pretty, I was thinking about the frame problem for over a decade. When all that came together, it was pretty clear to me that that was going to be important. What wasn't clear is that the surface syntax of separation logic would um, prove as popular and as durable as it has. And it is a good syntactic formalism for realizing what you get out of the semantics. There are other syntactic ways to get it. There's a new logic called frame logic or something. I think it's called from, maybe it's University of Illinois in front of Champaign. There's, there's dynamic frames. There's various syntactic ways to realize similar ideas. Um, I mean, separation logic has been surprisingly effective to me, the syntax of it, but you know, my basic, the semantic realizations to me were the most important part. And yeah, it was pretty clear that something interesting had come up at that point. Great. Um, so Emery Berger from uh, UMass Amherst um, brings you back to a point. So we're now, we're now uh, going live with these questions. So he's, he's actually responding to something you've said um, cool. already. So he said, you mentioned buffer overflows as being hard to handle at scale with static analysis, but he points out that it's easy to do dynamically yeah. with some overhead. So can you talk about other problems that are amenable to dynamic analysis that you wish static analyses could do a better job of handling? Yeah, you know what? Um, that's, a, that's an especially good one, buffer overflows, because they're so irritating um, and, and we think we should be able to handle them statically. Um, I'll have to get back to Emery on that. Um, what are the problems that dynamic is so good at? Um, I would have said, I would have said um, things related to taint analysis. I would have said that and the things that the, um, besides memory problems, that the buzzers are going after. But um, there's this work from Facebook by Lagozzo and Vandrich and people on a static analysis that they've deployed called Zonkalan, which catches vast numbers of, of these security problems quicker than with the, with the fuzzers. So I guess I wouldn't say that. I'd say the jury's out on all of that. So what about we, like data race detection? No, I think it, I mean, it's like we've got, we've got racer D right. um, static data race detector. It found 2.5 thousand bugs on our Android app or potential bugs. And it made a huge difference and it did this really fast and it helped us convert the um, Facebook Android app from a, a single threaded to a multi-threaded context. So it helped us, it helped the company do that. Um, I know, don't, I'm not aware of dynamic race detectors having any near that kind of impact. I might be wrong, but I'm not aware of it. So um, when I started work on Racer D, I thought I did it because I thought that it's too hard, right? It's too hard for static. So that sounds like fun, but then I did it and like, um, quite a lot of impact came out of it. So now I'm on the other side where I think the data race detection might be easier than buffer overruns, strangely enough. Um, so, but now you never know, we might, things might change around and, and somebody might have a good static approach at scale to buffer overruns because um, if they did, that would be great. It'll be complementary to the fuzzing and whatnot. Um, it'll help catch them earlier in the process. I've also heard from people that the fuzzing versus static are catching different kinds of problems. So the fuzzing, you've got to get there. You've got to run the program to get there. Where static, when it's um, compositional, it can start anywhere in the app. So it can explore things that are really hard to get to by the fuzzer. And 
I, right now they're complementary, as far as I'm aware. But I, what I just wish we had, not to beat the fuzzer, but I wish we had an effective at scale um, um, buffer overrun detector, so we could like complement them in it. Like we could meet them. We could meet the, the dynamic and say, yeah, we can contribute sort of as much as you or something comparable. Whereas I don't mm. think it's at the moment. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, I like the idea of combining the the fuzzing and the, and the static analysis. It's like you, you could use the static analysis to sort of get in, in inside the program and, and then from there start fuzzing. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so we've had a couple of questions, uh, again, relating to this uh, industry versus academia um, uh, situation. So um, Robert Chatley from Imperial College uh, says it seems relatively common these days for some academics to take up positions in tech companies and it's often with productive results. Um, do you think it could be beneficial to have more movement in the other way from companies into universities? Yeah, I do. Um, and, and especially, I mean, there's, there's, sometimes it happens, right? Um, and I know of a few cases. I don't think I'm going to name the individuals. Um, it would be good. I think the idea flow in both ways is the most important thing. Um, but the people flow carries the ideas. Like we found that getting the research ideas into the companies the most effective way was for people, be it the, you know, often postdocs, often PhD students, for the people to get embedded and they just take the ideas with them and then spread it. Um, it there is some idea flow going back a, a fair amount, but it would be great. Um, I don't, I haven't got a worked out idea for what the right model is for all this kind of thing, but I think the back and forth between the ac academia and the industry is really good. Um, and I'd like to support it and see more of it. But like I said, I don't have the worked out model for the best way to do these things. It's hard because things are changing so fast as far as all that goes. Right, yes. Um, so a, a related question comes from Stefan Zitzer uh, from UCL, who asks, what are your thoughts on industry academia collaborations? Um, how can both sides benefit from these? Are there limitations? And do you have any particular insights or recommendations for young PhD, PhD students um, who may have a more theoretical background? Yeah, um, it's very important um, when we, it, 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 these, these things can be hard. And I've tried it quite a number of times. And the difficulty is um, matching up the, the, the correct goal of the academic is fundamental advance of ideas. And the correct um, goal of the, the industrialists is Say it's to make a difference in the in the the, the mission of their company. Um, obviously, the, the academics want to help society, and the, the industrialists want to help society. But they've got different goals. So we need to find projects of common interest, and and so to mutual benefit. And this is this is tricky. And I the only way I know to do it is for the people to talk, and then have find out where there are some common interests, but then scope down the projects so that if the project succeeds, it will work for both of them. Um, and we've done this on a number of, of occasions, like um, in this thing, the Razor D concurrency work, I worked with Nikos Goragianis of, of Middlesex and Ilya Sergei then of UCL, that worked out really good. See, they ended up proving some theorems that we proposed in the industry, right? The industrialists proposed the theorems based on their experience. And then these folks went away and told them the theorems are actually false and we need to change them. And then they proved them, that was great. And then we've got one going with Arbrucken right now on incorrectness separation logic and C++ program analysis. And again, we had to scope down um, the collaboration part so that it wasn't only about the industrial problem, but also that it had to write um, the right sort of technical questions to lead to decent to good research results and it, it's not easy it, took a, it takes a lot of talking a lot of talking but it, i think it's valuable in the end it's valuable for the experience of all involved going forward just as much as the specific results too but again i don't have a silver bullet answer oh there was advice for the phd student it's to pay attention to this but you know as a phd student it's important to think broadly, to look at some things, but when it comes to doing the work, you have to focus. So I would say to the PhD student to be careful of spreading yourself too thin when it comes to the exact work that you're gonna do. 
spread yourself thin in you know your free time thinking about ideas. But um, yeah, some care is needed there for the PhD students. You got to finish that thesis. Good. Um, so we've had a few responses um, to to the things we've, we've been talking about. So Doug Lee chimes in to say thanks. That was a better answer uh, than our murky murky mumblings from back then. Um, uh, so uh, regarding the um, uh, dynamic and static analysis uh, discussion, so Emery Berger uh, points out that uh, thread sanitizer has had a massive impact within uh, Google, and Tej uh, Chajed uh, says that the Go uh, dynamic race detector is also widely used uh, both at Google. And uh, yeah, maybe I yeah. didn't refer in the right way. We didn't find things for Java Android, the dynamic detectors that could, that could do that, and then. Yeah, I have huge respect for the uh, for the thread sanitizer say. And one of the reasons we're trying to do the work was because the thread sanitizer authors actually, and other dynamic authors, they took static is hard as reason for doing it. So the, the way they, they wrote, I, I'm not hoping not putting words in their words, but the way I read their papers was static has almost been proven not to work. <laughs> so let's do dynamic. Because um, they, they reference certain actually great papers by Angler and um, Ashcroft, for instance, on one of the early race detectors. And there was big challenges in these works and, and they were a reaction to that. And then they've had impact and so, yeah, I respect them. And um, I might've misspoke about the level of impact or something like, but um, the 2.5K bugs out of the static detector I thought was pretty good. And you know, enable, enabling us to write the app multi-threaded when we couldn't otherwise, that was pretty good. So. Um, yeah, so maybe they're getting closer to um, comparable. <laughs> and um, Matt Jabinski um, also points out from our discussion about the uh, interaction between fuzzing and um, static analysis. He uh, it refers to some uh, work on gray box fuzzing and hybrid fuzzing uh, by Patrice uh, Godefroy uh, oh, and I others. But, uh, what's, we, what's he asking about it? Sorry. Oh, just uh, just what are your thoughts on on this sort of grey box fuzzing, hybrid fuzzing, uh, in the context of combining the best features of these uh, these types of analyses? So cool, but I think I, my take on it is that the grey box fuzzing is like, say, the grey box fuzzing has similar characteristics to um, even symbolic execution. Mm -hmm. In some sense, it can get you down more paths, and then American fuzzy love and all these things show that. Oh my God, but if we just be very efficient and go as many paths as possible, that can be pretty effective. Um, so, so it gets down more paths, but the fundamental point of view of these things is whole program analysis, not very incremental. Even as far as I'm aware, the, um, the, 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 the Godefroy work is, is like that. Um, and, and I've been interested in this question. So because people haven't mentioned it, but I've made this thing recently in correctness logic. And I've been talking to a lot of people in, in fuzzing about this kind of thing. And the fuzzing experts who also do static, by, by static, I mean like things like infer and covarity, which are purely static and they're compositional. So they can start from anywhere in the program. They don't have to start from main. And what I'm getting back is that they're catching different kinds of bugs. And so what I think is that Godefroy and company, you might think of it as like a super duper fuzzer. Um, maybe it's a, a cleverer fuzzer in some ways, but it's gonna have some of the limitations that fuzzers are gonna have. Um, there's gonna be the areas of the program that it doesn't get to where static can very easily start from in the middle of the program, very, very easily. And it can go really, really fast in an incremental way. I can deploy it at diff time, no problem. I don't need to run thousands of machines overnight or anything like that, but Static has the other problems of some false positives and things like this, which the um, dynamic doesn't. So I don't. I think this is hugely, hugely impressive work by uh, on, on the gray box fuzzing. But I think it's sort of like its pluses and minuses in the broad sense are like the the, the fuzzers, um, and they're of a different character to the pluses and minuses of the cool tools, more like infer and covarity and Zonkaland which um, the great thing about them is you don't even need a whole program. You can start anywhere. It's incremental, um, but they have some negatives. Sounds, sounds reasonable. So, so on the theme of, um, of incremental analysis, um, Anushri Jana from TCS Research in India um, 
asks, what are your thoughts on summary-based incremental analysis, um, both non-compositional and compositional? Well, my thoughts are this, is that the compositional approaches have been proven to be effective so far. And let me, I, I understand this question, so let me replay it for the audience. A bit more. So you can make a top-down whole program, summary-based program analysis. So that's where you, you create the summaries on demand as you dive into the functions. Um, the, uh, the compositional way, you create, try to create a very general summary without looking at the call sites. Now, this top-down um, increment, incremental analysis, it sort of it exists in principle, but I'm not too aware of it um, having a lot of success in practice. And I think it's problematic, because let me put it like this. In Facebook, we have tens of millions of lines code bases. Um, my compositional analysis, I can apply to these co code bases, no problem. But for me to um, apply the top-down summary-based um, analysis to the code bases, first, I've got to get the answers for the top-down analysis. Then I can incrementalize. The first step getting the answers is hard for that approach. Now, I'm not saying that it must be so. Um, maybe it could be used Maybe it could, we could get some really good incremental, some benefit from those incremental algorithms. I'm just saying it's harder as a starting point than the compositional. And the compositional, so far, as far as I'm aware, has had a lot more impact. It doesn't need to be that way in the future. Thank you. Um, Gabor Horvath from Iotfos Iloránd University in Hungary uh, says, when writing static analysis software, I often wish that developers didn't do X or Y. Do you think it's reasonable to expect developers to write more static analysis friendly code in some cases? Or is it always the author of the tool who has to adapt? Oh, no, it's a two way street for sure. Um, there, there, without, without doubt, it's a two way street. Um, and, you know, the, one thing that I think is not not a good approach is for the for the um, static analysis or the, the tool writer to take a holier than thou attitude, saying everybody should adapt to me. That's not good. But the reverse necessary the reverse isn't necessarily good either. And so, when we talk to um, developers on how to make certain checks in software, um, if it's important enough to them, I find they will they will do workarounds because they can see the end goal. This could be like, um, to take this very simple example, to rid a code base of null pointer exceptions, um, you might be forced to write some, some, some checks that aren't literally necessary. So in, not necessary in a semantic sense to make the type checker or the static analyzer happy. Um, but developers in my experience are willing to, to pay that price if the end goal is good. Right, so you, you 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 enter into a discussion and a contract, so to speak, with with the developers. And yes, I find they will adapt. Now, we 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 can't expect that we will just say blah blah and they will adapt in, all the time. But you can enter into a back and forth with them, and a give and take, and 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 that tends to work out well when there's listening on both sides, but especially from the static analysis people. Very good. Um. So I had a couple of non-technical questions, I guess. Um, so um, you've been attending programming languages conferences for, I reckon, in about 20 years, according to DBLP. And so I was wondering if you'd noticed any changes, whether that's scientific changes or social changes, in those conferences over that time. Well, um, I hope that nobody will mind me saying that. I, think, I feel like PLDI is getting more like Popple used to be. Mm. I remember I used to read the PLDI papers and um, it, it wasn't all that theoretical, I didn't think, um, 20 years ago. And now, if I have a paper that would have been a good Popple paper now or 20 years ago, um, PLDI has no problem to submit it to. Um, it might, it's probably the converse too. So that um, there's lots of, um, I won't say unification, there's lots of understanding, maybe more shared understanding before the between the practice and the theory communities, I think, than, than before, and such that we may not even have quotes communities. And I don't know the exact reasons for this, but I'll observe that like 
what before would have been a very theoretical subject of program verification now has tools with real programs being verified and, and abstract interpretation and the mathematical side of program analysis now has more serious experiments. And so it all naturally comes together. So that's one thing I've noticed, um, which makes me happy not to have those divides. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I, I wonder if it also has to do with it, um, that if, if it's, I mean, generally seems to be the case that there are um, a greater volume of papers being submitted to places like Popple and PODI over the years. And, and so that, and, but a fairly similar, I think, number of papers being accepted each year. So perhaps you just have more runoff from one conference onto the next. And so maybe this leads to some sort of Gaussian blurring sort of effect. Could be. Could be to do that as well. Um, so, um, I think this, this maybe I, I will end up making this the last question and let you uh, um, have a break. Um, so I've been, I've thoroughly enjoyed asking the following question of the various people that I've been interviewing for the People of PL um, interview series. So let me ask you as well, what would you be if you were not a computer scientist? Well, um, I wasn't good enough to play in the NBA, but I wanted to be a basketball player when I was young and I was I played in university for my university team back in, in Canada and as a point guard because I'm short. So I think um, I would have liked to be a basketball player or maybe a fisherman, but probably not a scientist. So I fell into computer science. It wasn't a plan. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to take a degree, which ensured I had a job so that I could play golf and go fishing in the summer. Right. Then I turned out to like computer science more than I realized I would. And, and um, maybe I was a bit better at it than I was ever expecting. I and mean, that's definitely true. Um, so maybe I haven't done as much fishing and basketball and golf as I would have done because I like computer science so much. But yeah, I'd be doing, hopefully I'd be doing something like that and maybe not even be a scientist. Cool. That's fascinating. I, I had no idea about any of those things. Um, Karim Ali uh, says, we the North and a basketball symbol, which presumably is some reference that you will understand. There's a lot of good basketball players in Canada now, yeah. Right, okay, cool. I, I have no idea. Excellent, well, I, I, think, I think that's a good place to, to wrap this up. So thank you very much. That's been very illuminating. Um, yeah, thanks, thank you John. For thanks everybody for, for listening and thanks very much for the questions, appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.